You love to watch gardening programmes. <laughs> Come on! You can do better. No. We love Alan <laughs> Do you know, I have really enjoyed watching the Chelsea Flower Show, all the other flower shows. And I'm sure some of you have. <laughs> and I love to look into all the show gardens, whether they're big or small. There's always something to learn. Now, we haven't got a garden. We've only got a balcony, but we've got a lot of plants. <laughs> And we've got grass, albeit artificial. <laughs> so we still love to watch the gardening programmes because you can learn a lot. The types of soil, the conditions plants need, the weather conditions. And there are so many varieties of every kind of species from trees to shrubs to flowers to vegetables. Then at the flower show, there are the prizes. Gold, silver, silver gilt, bronze, and finally, the best in show. Well, none of you lot are going to get that, are you? Because you don't like gardens. <laughs> but this year, one of my favourite gardeners, Chris Beardshaw, won best garden in the show, and he's won it quite a few years running. But this set me thinking about places in the Bible that we could look into, like I like to look into all these different gardens that have taken time, experience, they've had to plan, they've had to get everything ready. It's such a lot of work, and I thought we'd look at some of the places in the Bible, some places we could learn something from. And I know I'm a bit strange, everybody knows that, but these things just seem to come to me. That's why I was in our dining room this afternoon, like this. The first place for us to check out and to have a little look into is the most obvious one. The garden not made by human hands. Monty Don wasn't there or Chris Beardshaw, but made by God himself. And we read about it, don't we, in the book of Genesis, and it's the Garden of Eden. But this was a perfect place. Trees, shrubs, flowers, vegetables, but best of all, no weeds. This garden would trump any at Chelsea as best in show. And it was not just a perfect garden, but it was for perfect people to live in. That is, until as we know, they had to do things their way instead of God's way. And at that place, at that perfect place, sin entered the world. Every person who ever lived, who has ever lived since then, has been affected by their actions. And this is the reason that the world is in the state it's in. It's because of sin. These two that were perfect people in a perfect place, but messed up, they were immediately expelled from this perfect garden and communion with God ended. Instead of being able to walk with him and talk with him in the cool of the day in the garden, all that was finished because they had messed up and sinned had entered the world. So, what's going to happen next then? A remedy is surely needed. 
and it's going to take a perfect person to put things right. Do you remember Job? I suppose you do, most of you. And all his trials. But he had it right when in all his trouble he cried out, Oh, if there was only someone who could be an advocate between sinful man and a holy God, someone who could speak for me and intercede on my behalf. And that's just what was needed. Job was right. It needed a perfect person, someone who was able to touch man, but also to touch a holy God. So there was a perfect plan. All through the Old Testament, we see that God's perfect plan is being worked out. The perfect plan was in place. And so the people who God had chosen had to be preserved. God's promises never fail. Get that into your mind today. If God has promised it, if it's in here, it will not fail. It is true. It is real. You can stand on it. You can believe in it. You can hold it and say, Lord, your word says a perfect promise. But what happened? Things went from bad to worse. And God just decided he was going to flood the whole world. But he needed to preserve some of his people. So he got a righteous man, Noah. We'll just have a little peep into his place, shall we? He built an ark. Oh dear, fancy building a boat on dry land, no water, no sea, no rain. What was that all about? But as we look into it, we see that God had told him, he'd given him the idea of what he was to do because he needed to preserve his people. Well, after 120 years, the flood came, but only eight people were saved, but they were preserved. God was still preserving his people. The plan had to come to pass. He preserved them time and time again. And we could look into so many places where we can read of his pres preservation. What about at the Red Sea? Fancy approaching the water with no way to get over, not a boat, not a canoe, nothing. But God was there to preserve his people. His plan could not be thwarted. What about in the wilderness, how he preserved his people? Even though they got everything wrong, they moaned and they groaned, God still preserved his people. And so all through the Old Testament, in fact, we could visit so many places where God was preserving his people. He had to keep his plan in action. But I want us to move on a little further now to another place so we can see how the perfect plan is being put into place. We can see it being put into place. So we are going to Bethlehem in the time of a famine. We read about this in the book of Ruth. A couple with two children, Naomi and Elimelech, with two sons, were in Bethlehem. And there was a famine. Well, what would you do if you've got two, two lads, two kids you needed to, to feed? 
well, you'd go and look for food, wouldn't you? And so they looked for a place of plenty. And they went to the place called Moab. Here, their boys were fed, they grew up, they got married to two girls, Ruth and Orpah. But sadly, this place of plenty became to Naomi a place of poverty because she not only lost her husband, but she also lost her two sons also. But you see, you've got to look behind all this because all of this was in God's perfect plan. So Naomi decided, no point in staying here, I may as well go home. She wanted to go back to Bethlehem, to her home. And one of her daughter-in-laws, Ruth, wanted to go with her. She'd seen something in Naomi that she wanted to stay with her. She wanted to be with her. She said, I'm going wherever you go, I'm going. Don't send me home, don't send me away. I want to go where you're going. And I want your God to be my God. And so off they went. Naomi going back from the land of plenty in poverty again. But God was always working one step ahead. Do you know that God is always one step ahead? Always leading and guiding. So we find this young girl, as we read in the book of Ruth, in a barley field belonging to a man called Boaz. And little did Ruth know when she was just collecting up what was dropped at the back of the reapers, she could just pick it up so they'd just got enough food to eat, just to keep them going, just to keep them alive. She was picking it up. And she didn't realise that she would meet a man who would change her life. And have a guess what? She would become one of the forerunners in the line of the Messiah. She would be the great-grandmother of King David. Can you see God's plan? Can you see God's plan at work? Here it is, because this was the line that the Messiah, the perfect person, was going to come through. So now we pop in somewhere else. Actually, we go back to Bethlehem. Have you ever thought about that? The same place that Ruth met Boaz was the place where years later the plan is coming into play and we are looking into a stable. The perfect person, the Messiah, the one promised is here at last. The only sinless one who could take away the sin of the whole world, the Messiah, Jesus Christ, who was born to do what Job had wanted, what he'd cried out for, to bring sinful man, us, to a holy God and bring us into a right relationship with him. He came in God's plan. He was born to die and on him was laid our sin. So tonight, as many as believe and repent of their sin are made right with God. When this happens, we can look in on another place to see his perfect provision for those who believe. 
Now, you have to excuse me because my papers are all over the place. Now, the place that we're going to look into now, I've called a wildflower meadow. Does anybody like wildflower meadows? Oh, surely, come on. A wildflower meadow. And we can read about this in Matthew and chapter 6. And this is where the perfect person has given to us the perfect provision. Here we are. Chapter 6. So, do not worry. You listening? Do not worry. What shall we eat? What shall we drink? What shall we wear? For guess who run, runs after this? The pagans. We shouldn't be running after those things. Your heavenly Father knows that you have need of all these things. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. And we go back a bit. Why do you worry about clothes? See how the lilies of the field grow. They don't labour or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendour was dressed like one of these. If, therefore, this is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire... Will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? This is what the Lord Jesus is telling us and his disciples. There's provision for you. I have made provision. How often we as believers... I won't ask for a show of hands, but I'll put mine up, worry and fret about everything and anything. How we're going to manage, what's going to happen in the future, what if our resources run out. But this is a marvellous picture shown to us by the Lord Jesus himself. He wants us to understand that he has got everything in hand. He is our provider, not for the unnecessary, but for our basic needs. Remember, that's what he said in the pattern prayer, isn't it? He taught us to pray, give us this day, just this day. Not tomorrow, not next week, not next month. God's looking after us day by day. Here in this field, in this wildflower meadow, he gives us a picture, a beautiful picture of his provision. Look at the lilies. Now, come on, Gloria, you're the gardener. Aren't they beautiful? Aren't the flowers beautiful? Gloria, you've let me down. <laughs> but flowers are so beautiful. If you look at a flower, any flower, a wildflower from the meadow, they are beautiful, absolutely beautiful. God has made the flowers. So what are we worrying about? What are we worrying about? It says Solomon, in all his glory, in all his splendour, he got loads of money, got lots of clothes, probably gold threads through his clothes as well. But even Solomon isn't arrayed as good as these flowers. They are just beautiful. 
And in the same passage, he talks to us about the birds that flow in, fly into the, this wildflower meadow. And it says that the heavenly father watches over them day or uh, night. He even knows when one of them falls to the ground. Fancy that. I've never seen any worried birds of you. Have you ever seen a magpie come in? in it, they come up over by us and, oh dear, they are naughty birds. But they don't say, look as if they're worried or depressed. They know where the food is. They know where they're going to get it from. They don't have to fret and worry. And friends, tonight we should stop running around like these headless chickens because we are living in God's field of provision. We have everything that we need. Just take that tonight, folks. We have everything we need. God has provided everything for us. Well, we're going to move off from the wildflower meadow and we're going to move on to another place that we find in John and chapter 4. My food, said Jesus, is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Do you not say four months more and then the harvest? I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. They are ripe for harvest. Even now the reaper draws his wages. Even now he harvests the crop for eternal life so that the sower and the reaper may be glad together. Thus the saying, one sows and another reaps is true. I sent you to reap what you have not worked for. Others have done the hard work and you have reaped the benefits of their labour. Now this is a place we'd all rather keep out of because work needs to be done. Did you notice? The work is twofold. Some sow and some reap. And here I think Jesus is telling us to stop making excuses and to open our eyes for the fields are ripe for harvest. <coughs> we may not be able to see it with our natural eye, but we must believe God that there is indeed work to be done. So, some of you have got to be sowers and others reapers. I know what some of you are going to say, well, I couldn't. I couldn't do anything like that. I'm no good at that. But there's all kinds of ways of sowing into people's lives. You can just speak to someone. You can help someone. Show someone kindness and love. There are many ways to put the seed of the word of God into people's lives. So the sowers. So that may be a job for you. Then there are reapers. Someone will have already sown the seed. It will have already started to grow. And then perhaps the reaper will come along and say just the right word. Just a little word. It'll make the reaping easy. Because all the hard work has already been done. But always remember, it's the Lord of the harvest that makes the seed grow. So we've got no excuse. We don't know who God's going to call. We don't. So we have to sow into people's lives, whoever, wherever they are. And God will give the increase. It's time for us to step up 
into this field that the harvest is truly plenteous, but the laborers are few. So we must pray that the Lord of the harvest will send workers into this harvest field. So that's a place to work in. Come on, folks, get your togs on, because we need to do the work. Now, we're moving on again now. We're going to another place, have a look in another place, see what we can see there. Let me find it. Jesus told them a parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while everyone was sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. When the wheat sprouted and formed ears, then the weeds also appeared. The owner's servants came to him and said, Sir, didn't you sow good seed in your field? Where then did the weeds come from? An enemy did this, he replied. The servants asked him, do you want us to go and pull them up? No, he answered, because while you are pulling up the weeds, you may root up the wheat with them. Let them both grow together until the harvest. This is the place where an enemy has been at work. This is a place where we all are at the moment. We are planted in this place. This is an unavoidable place for us if we are truly planted in the Christian life. But did you notice how he said an enemy had planted things in the field that we would rather not have. Weeds among the wheat. Unbelievers in with believers. My dad used to say, there's believers, there's unbelievers, and there's make-believers. We've got to be sure that we are amongst the believers. So we are here, planted in this place. You see, right back in that Garden of Eden, the enemy began sowing seed in the lives of people. Seeds of sin, of sickness, distress, trials and eventual death. And here in this passage, we are told that these things must remain. They must remain. Until the harvest, until Christ comes back again, they must remain. Because in the world, we will have tribulation. We're planted here. We're stuck with it. The weeds with the wheat. We're just in it. Many people today think they can get rid of all these things and expect God to be like a slot machine. You put your money in and you get your tears or your weeds out. Sorry, friends, God doesn't work like that. It's only by his sovereign will that things can be changed. It isn't just ask and have with God. Pain and suffering will always be until Jesus finally returns. I know that God can and does in some cases work miracles, but sometimes and most times, we have to go through and persevere. We're planted here. We have no choice. We're the wheat amongst the weeds, and we have to suck it up, as they say. Did you notice it isn't God that's done these things, as so many unbelievers think? Amazing, isn't it? They don't believe in God, but any, when anything happens, oh, it's always God's fault, isn't it? Did you notice it says that the enemy has done it? So yes, life is hard and bad things do happen to good people. 
but God is always one step ahead, as we saw in our previous stop-off. Some seemingly bad things, some good. But in God's plan and purpose, one day, friends, we will understand. We'll understand. Then we could look into another place, but I don't really want to say much about this. I've called this a battlefield, and we are in a battle. We are in a battle. The weeds are still growing. We're still in with them. We're still here. They're still growing. But have no fear, because as we look in here, God has provided protection. Protection for the child of God. And we can read all about that in Ephesians 6, when we can read about the armour that he has given to us as our protection. <coughs> so we'll move on again and we'll come to our final stop, our final spot. And we'll have a look in here. And this is the fa favourite one. And we find this one again, the same place, but at a different time. We find this in Matthew 13 and verse 39. 38, sorry. The field, that's where we planted, is the world. And the good seed stands for the sons of the kingdom. The weeds are the sons of the evil one. And the enemy who sows them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age. And the harvesters are angels. As the weeds are pulled up and burned in the fire, so will it be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send out his angels and they will weed out of his kingdom everything that causes sin and all who do evil. They will throw them into the fiery furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears, let him hear. So this is the same place, but another time. This is the field that the Lord of the harvest will send out angels to gather and reap at the end of the age. This is the time we're looking forward to. When everything will be sorted out. The wheat from the weeds. The believers from the unbelievers. And the burning up of everything that's causing us pain in this life. It's going to end, folks. There's going to an end come to it. All these things are going to be burned up. The things that the enemy has sown into our lives. And the final enemy, death, will be finished at last and life eternal will be the order of the day for the children of God. The former things, that's the things that are going on now, the former things will be passed away. Guess what? There'll be a new heaven and a new earth, the home of righteousness. Ah, this is our final stop, our final visit. But what a finale it will be when the kingdoms of this world will become the kingdom of our God and of his Christ and he shall reign forever Hallelujah. and ever. Amen. Oh, what a hope we've got tonight, haven't we, folks? So look up, look up. You know what I say? Even so, Lord, come quickly. Wouldn't it be wonderful if the Lord Jesus came tonight and all this that we've been looking at from the scripture came to pass? There was a perfect place. There'll be a perfect place again. God has a perfect plan. 
He had the perfect person who gave us a perfect provision. He gave us a perfect purpose. And he gave us the ability to persevere, to continue on. And he gave us the joy of looking forward to the place of perfection, the place to hope in. So, although you're not gardeners, I'll let you off. But I hope you've enjoyed our little look into some of the lovely places in the scripture and learned something for your encouragement and my encouragement. I've been encouraged as I've looked in to these places and I just pray that God will just bless you all through the week there is to come. Amen.